This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On December the 9th, our final virtual military history night of the fall 2020 season hosted RCMI member Bob Farkerson. Bob was RCAF aircrew in the grueling Burma campaign of 1944-45, and tonight he tells us his story of keeping the campaign supplied from the air. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to RCMI Virtual Military History Night, Wednesday, December the 9th, 2020. My name is Patricia Hindwhite, and I organize this event. This presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes and available for viewing on RCMI YouTube channel. I would like to thank the behind the scenes RCMI team for their expertise and strong support. RCMI President Mike Hall, General Manager Garrett Wright, Sylvia Lau, Event Sales Manager and in-house Zoom expert, Jim Lutz, Social Committee Chair, <laughs> Eric Morse, RCMI Newsletter Editor, Director of Publications and member of RCMI Strategic Committee, and also producer of videos for RCMI. A question and answer period follows this presentation, and I ask you to hold your questions until that time. Use the raise your hand feature or chat icon at the bottom of the screen. And I ask you at this time to mute your mics. To mute, click the mute button to the left of your screen. Click again to un unmute. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in for a real treat this evening with guest speaker Bob Ferguson with a first-hand account of the time when the world was at war and he, a very young pilot serving in Burma. I might add that through Bob, the Burma Star Banner was donated to RCMI, where it is now very proudly displayed. Bob was born in Alberta, 1923, and in 1941 joined the Canadian Army just four days after finishing high school. By November, he was in Britain with the Canadian Army along the south coast, the southeast coast, guarding against German invasion. He was transferred 18 months later to the RCAF and sent back to Canada for pilot training. He gained his wings in 1944. He was posted back to England and from there to India and eventually Burma. Following the war, he enrolled in the University of British Columbia and then University of California, Berkeley for his PhD. After graduation, he obtained a position of professor of German literature, literature at Victoria College, University of Toronto, retiring in 1988. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, a very warm welcome and over to you. The floor is, virtually speaking, yours, Bob. <laughs> well, thank you, Pat. And I'm so glad to be here. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell my story very quickly because we want to save time. I think you know how the story begins. The, the Japanese were looking for oil, rubber, and rice to back up their war in Burma, in China. China. And they invaded Malaya in December of 1941, 75 minutes after the war was, the bomb was dropped on Pearl Harbor. They swept through all of this area, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, French Indochina, Siam, and then Burma, right through the, to the border with China, Burma and India, all in a five month blitzkrieg. It's called Japan's 100 Days. For almost two years then, 
the two armies glared at each other across the border, Burma border with skirmishing and invasive patrols. One invasion, in fact, being a full-scale penetration of 30,000 Allied troops behind the Japanese lines. Then, on March the 10th, 1944, Mutaguchi, the Japanese general, made his move. He pushed westward across the Chindrin, bound for Delhi. Bill Slim, watch his chin, he's a determined man, decisively the defeated that Japanese effort to march to Delhi. And instead he pushed eastward across the Chinwin, bound for Rangoon. And that's where tonight's adventure begins. One of Slim's first concerns was the line of communication, his supply line. Everything came originally from the US, from Los Angeles, San Francisco and Prince Rupert, uh, ports on the west coast of North America. The Americans insisted on calling it Port Rupert. I think they had a, a reaction to anything royal. Anyway, there was a long and tedious journey across the Pacific and then sweeping down around in between Australia and New Zealand and Australia and the Dutch East Indies to get up into Rangoon. And then from there, from Rangoon, there was a long and tedious 600 mile tentative journey on the railway from Calcutta, I'm sorry if I said Rangoon, I meant Calcutta, from Calcutta all the way through with a ferry crossing of the Brahmaputra here and another ferry crossing of the Brahmaputra there. This second, the first one, they had to uncouple the whole train and cross car by car. Here, they not only had to cross car by car, but they had to readjust every axle to meet the gauge, the meter gauge of this little tea planters railway that took them to Dimapur, the isle, the end of steel. Lido appears where the Americans continued with their material that was then, then onward into China over the hump route, flown into China but for the material that was sent for, meant for Burma, went down a tedious mountain road, just a single track road and ended up at Imphal. The, the gradients along that bit of railway were steep and the trains had to be short until Actually, locomotives, heavier locomotives were brought up, brought in from Canada to haul those trains. But then they came to Tim to Imphal, and that the last mile, what the army calls the gap, the last mile was from Imphal to the front line. The, for Slim, this was a big problem. One miserable and highly inadequate mountain track led south from Impal. And there was the Chindwin along here. Here's Impal, here's the Chindwin. And some <clears throat> traffic could go on the Chindwin. But basically, 90% of everything that came into Burma from Imphal 
had to be brought in by air. Now, he, Slim had five RAF transport squadrons and three American transport squadrons. And with that, he reckoned he could just do the job. Then, at the very moment when the big push through Burma was to begin, the Americans recalled its three transport squadrons back to China. This was a devastating administrative crisis for Slim. Even the imperturbable imper Slim was perturbed at that. Fortunately, there was a miracle waiting in the wings. Two Royal Canadian squadrons, fully trained and eager to get into action. In my book, two Canadian squadrons compensated for three Canadian squadrons any day. One of those squadrons was 435. It went forward and began operating on December the 20th, 1944. And its sister squadron, 436, followed a month later. I was a month member of 435 squadron. My journey to 435 began with flight training in England on a Tiger Moth, then culminated in the proud day in Calgary when I got my wings and my commission. Then came operational training in Comox, where I was crewed up with a navigator and a wireless operator air gunner. We trained for long distance overseas flights using astro navigation and radio direction finding. And we graduated as a fully qualified transport crew. Then we were sent to Britain and from there joined newly formed 435 Squadron in India. This was 435 Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force. At fully Canadian squadron. We, in, from India, we went forward to Burma in, 19, in December of 1944, well aware that we had an important job to do and we were ready for it. I was not the only Canadian that after three years of training and waiting was eager to get into action. So here we were, my crew, that's Swifty, Charlie Swift, Char, Chas to us on the left. Rip Collins, my navigator from Windsor, Ontario, myself at the end of the row, and Gordy Shillard, who was a good deal younger. Well, come to think of it, I was only 20. Uh, by that time, <clears throat> Gordy was about 18 or 19. And that uh, that was my crew. Uh, Chas Swift was actually Royal Air Force, non-Canadian, but he was, the whole squadron was Canadian except for one or two uh, Brit, uh, RAF people that got in there. And here's my aircraft. Now, if you can't, See that one? Maybe you can see this one. That's a beautiful aircraft that my friend Peter Harris made just for me. And that's called, it's a Dakota. It has po powered by three, a uh, two Pat, Pratt and Whitney 13 horsepower engines. 95 foot wingspan and when you're in the in the office here you're he, here you're about 15 feet from the ground it cruises about 130 miles per hour and has a service ceiling about 15,000 feet there's no beauty but it's a very sturdy aircraft. 
was came into service in 1935 and it's still in operation. Well, our job was to take a load with that aircraft and by either dropping it or landing and unloading it, taking it right to the front lines. We work closely with the Army. There's an Army liaison officer attached to our squadron, and he delivered to suppli the supplies to our aircraft, and we took it from there to the front, flying uh, three or four sorties a day. A flight flew one day and B flight flew the next day and we just continued with never a day off. That is, we had alternate days off, but there were no weekends. We usually started flying at about five o'clock in the morning and each sortie took two to three hours. So the usual flying day was seven to 10 hours. To save time, we ate at the strip, standing up, and goggling, gobbling a bully beef sandwich and a cup of tea between sorties. At the end of the lunch line, there were three bowls, salt tablets, vitamin tablets, and mepicron or ap, uh, ap to atabrine, the anti-malarial. And the orderly officer stood over that uh, group of bowls and made sure we took our anti-malarial pills. That way the, con the squadron had a very good record for uh, no or very little malarial infection, which was remarkable in an area where more than 50% of the casualties were due not to enemy action, but to malaria. Anyway, the day started with the operations officer briefing me while the navigation officer briefed the navigator. Basically, we're told what the Met would be and the recognition signals for the day on the dropping zone. And then we took, across, uh, took off across the mountains and jungles of Northern Burma. What we were looking for was a DZ, the dropping zone, that showed the recognitional signals we'd been given. All the navigation trips that we'd been taught in Canada were useless. There was no radar to speak of, and there was certainly no time for astro navigation, that is taking a shot and plotting it on a, on a map. There were really no significant landmarks either. How my navigator Rip found the dropping zone, I'll never know. There's another problem with dropping zones. The Army had to estimate a couple of days before, beforehand where the, they would locate the next dropping zone and tell us what they needed. They chose the location from a map and their maps were pretty inaccurate. So they could, they didn't know whether the location they chose would be on the top of a mountain or halfway down the mountain or in the very bottom of a steep valley where we had to almost dive bomb to make our uh, drops and we had to climb like hell to get out of there. The worst case though was the, when, when the army they reached its designated spot and set out the DZ markings for the day. And then they were pushed off the spot again and the enemy held the DZ and they were no fools. They took half our drop before they started sh shooting at us. And then we knew that the dropping zone was in the wrong hands, but that wasn't too bad. The U.S. Uh, the um, Japanese rifle is a .25 caliber, not much bigger than a .22, and it wasn't too dangerous. Well, once we found the dropping zone, the kipper kickers in the back crammed the doorway with supplies. We we flew without a door, and I got down low and slow. I like dropping at about 
400, 300 feet at a two, 110 miles an hour. And when I thought we were at, at the appropriate, appropriate moment coming up to the dropping zone, I rang the bell and the kickers loaded the dropping, the floor, doorway with all the supplies that it would fill. Then I turned on the green light and they pushed all the supplies out the door. As you can see, one man on the floor and the others up on top and they're pushing it. These are the static lines ad attached to parachutes on the material that was going out. They're 30 feet long. And when they reached the end of the 30 feet, they pulled the pin that opened the parachute so that the object that was being dropped was well clear of the plane and the parachute didn't catch on the, on the tail plane as it flew out. Now, the, everything was, was rather regular except one thing. We didn't talk about going flying, we talked about going dicey. And we joked every day that the meteorological, meteorologist's report was 10 tenths cloud with intermingled mountain tops. Now in Southeast Asia, the monsoons dominate from May to September. Day after day, unrelenting rain, up to five inches of rain in 24 hours, and a whole sky full of midnight dark cloud. And in the middle of all this cloud, there's bound to be a cumulonimbus cloud, a CB. A CB, a cumulonimbus, is a roiling, tumbling mass of vicious upcurrents and downcurrents, driven by madly powerful wings winds to a height of 30 or 40,000 feet. In training, pilots are drilled never, ever fly into a cumulonimbus cloud. On the squadron, I don't think I know of any pilot who didn't eventually blunder into one. Three, in the three squadrons, well, in the course of our operations, three squadron of our squadron aircraft flew out and were never heard of again. Well, actually, Yohan, you may have heard of it. It was found 50 years after the war ended. That was one of our planes that was the victim of a monsoon cloud. And I saw another aircraft that came home with the tail plane at a 15 degrees angle to the male plane, main plane because the monsoon had twisted the fuselage. My turn for uh, an encounter with a CB came in June of 1945. We'd been dodging heavy cloud for a fortnight finding lighter patches of sky to sneak through to get to the dropping zone. But this day it wasn't working. Each promising alley closed in behind us and got darker ahead. Then it hit. First, unbelievable turbulence, as if one, some mighty hand had got hold of us and was shaking us all over the sky, tipping us onto one wing and then onto the other, buffeting at us with fists of wind that you could almost hear. The rain was not rain, it was a deluge like Niagara Falls. The windshield wipers were useless and the darkness was absolute impenetrable blackness. blackness. I couldn't see the navigation lights on the wingtips 50, 45 feet away. I couldn't even see the propellers 15 feet out my window. Then a current of irresistible force started hurtling us downward. 
the climb and glide indicator was showing a descent of 30,000 feet a minute. And Chas, my second pilot, and I together were pulling the wheel back with all our strength and could not budge it. It was as though it was welded. The altimeter was unwinding like a clock, clock on that. And below us, there was nothing but mountains. Suddenly we broke through and came out in a valley. Throughout, I'd been fighting and swearing at that implacable enemy. Not afraid, but boiling mad. Now, my feet were shaking on the rudder bars. I handed over to Chas to take us home. And all he could do was climb back up into the clouds and gingerly, prayerfully feel our way out up the top. Enemy was the other problem, but enemy action was rare. We had complete control of the skies. But enemy action did catch up with us in February, 1945. When Herb Coons, flight commander of B flight, I was in A flight, I wasn't while well flying that day. Well, B flight was dropping at Schwebo, just north of Mandalay. He noticed a Japanese fighter coming into the circus, circuit. He first alerted the other three aircraft, then told his wireless operator to keep watch at the astro hatch. That's a little dome up in the top where one could take the astro shots, which of course we in Burma, we never did. But there, from there, the wireless operator could see, see what was happening and he was to shout when the fighter was locked on. When the wag shouted, now, Herb made a sharp, flat rudder turn. He was right down on the deck, by the way. That was the first thing. Get right down on the deck. Make a sharp, flat rudder turn. And the fighter screamed by him. Unable to turn inside the slow old Dakota. Twice more, Herb pulled that trick. The last time so low that he lost three feet from the wingtip in a tree. He somehow brought that hair, damaged aircraft home. And for that action, Herb Coons was awarded an immediate DFC. By the way, he already had a DFC, having been previously a navigator on a, 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 a patrol scene, flying boat in Britain and been shot down there. So this was his second encounter with the enemy and the second VFC. But meanwhile, a second fighter shot down another of our aircraft, killing the crew of six. And a third aircraft was so damaged that the pilot had to make a forced landing. Bert Simpson, just arriving at the drop, landed to help the downed aircraft. He and his navigator pulled the one survivor from that burning aircraft and carried him two miles to an airport army post. For this, Bert Bob II was awarded an immediate DFC. That's not the light. Okay. All in all, we lost three aircraft and six men killed, eight wounded, all in 15 minutes. Down below, the army saw what was happening and the colonel of the regiment wrote to our commanding officer. I'm quoting, it was terrible to watch. Your boys had been supplying us 
for several weeks. They made a damn good job of it. And we've come to think of them as our special friends. It was maddening to see those Japs go for the helpless Dakotas. After it was all over, a Sikh sepoy came up to me and said, Saab, if the Canadian subs have to lose their lives to bring us food, then perhaps we can go on half rations. At the time he made this suggestion, we were already on half rations. Well, for me, this message indicates not only human concern, but also the close relationship between the Air Force and the Army in the Burma War. And that, by the way, was not always the case in other theaters of war. But in Burma, I really considered that my command, ultimate commanding officer, I don't know who it was, some uh, group captain, I guess, in the Air Force, but I thought it was General Slim. We really did feel we belonged more to the Army than to the Air Force, and they certainly felt that way about us. I remember once we brought a group of uh, uh, troops home, and uh, when they got out, it had been a pretty rough trip. I admit, I admit the, the turbulence was pretty severe, and uh, the Army wasn't used to that sort of treatment. A lot of them got sick, but when they got out, they said, I wouldn't fly through that every day for the day, all the tea in China. And we looked at them. We knew that they had just been 30 days of living never, never dry, mud and rain for 30 days. And of course, very rugged, uh, tasteless rations all through. And we, I thought to myself, I would never li live through that life for two, three, for all the tea in China, and uh, we were, it was a mutual admiration society. But apart from any interventions and the constant threat of monsoon clouds, there was a bit of routine about what we did, like dropping rice. Rice came to us, slack, pack, double sack so that it wouldn't burst when it la landed. It was simply stacked up in the doorway and kicked out. It landed, it bounced once or twice and skidded to a slot. Another time I dropped a big wicker basket full of fresh eggs packed in straw and of course with a parachute attached. Well, there, there was a free dropping and parachute dropping. Well, I wonder how that went. I have no idea whether the eggs uh, survived that drop or not. I only know I never dropped another box of eggs. And then, of course, there was mules. Uh, my, my slides are out of order, but the, uh, this is the slide a painting actually that one of our members commissioned after we got home of that attack of Burma, of uh, Shwebo, where uh, the Japanese, there you can see a, oh, great. There's a Japanese fighter and our aircraft with this. Uh, engine on fire, the one that had to crash land. And uh, there's the dropping zone down below. You can see there's not very much room that we had to hit when we were dropping. Uh, anyway, that got out of order and we we're back here where uh, our drop has landed and down below the uh, troops are waiting to uh, pick it up. This is actually a drop on Mandalay Hill. If you ever go to Mandalay, the hill is still there, but it has a great many pagodas built on it now. At the time, it was our, our 
easy point to drop in. And by the way, General Slim, it was the day after Mandalay was taken and General Slim was on, on the, the uh, strip at the time. Uh, so we dropped a lot of rice. We dropped the eggs. We also dropped mules. I'll, I'll confess, I never dropped a mule myself, but we did drop mules. I know about landing them, though. I'm sorry, about loading them. Where do we? My slides have gotten altogether out of order. I don't know how this happened. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. Yeah, but <clears throat> when you load a mule, it's very easy to do if you have lots of patience and lots of power, manpower, and lots of profanity. Then once they get in there, they settle down all right, except when the motors start, they start urinating. And that ends up going down through the floor of the aircraft and sort of getting stale in the bottom. And it takes an awful lot of scrubbing to get the bottom clean again so that you could stand the smell. Uh, anyway, mules dropped with two parachutes attached. Uh, and then when they, we found out that when they saw the land come, coming up to them, the ground coming up to them, they stiffened their arms their legs <clears throat> and uh, they broke their legs so the veterinarians decided the best thing to do was get them a bit dopey first and that worked after that they landed shake off the parachutes and happily trot, trot away to do their work the, the army boys became very fond of their mules and we carried everything, food, ammunition, uniforms. I made a note on my logbook that on May 29th, 1945, my load included flashlights, shaving brushes, liquor, and beer. And we gave personal service too. When the Colonel broke his favorite pipe, we brought him a new one. When one man lost his false teeth, we brought him a new set. And by the way, what really galled me was that very often we dropped Canadian whiskey. And in the mess of, back at home, we were dropping Indian three feathers. We were drinking Indian three feathers rum, which is pretty terrible stuff. Well, there was a lot of routine, but there were unusual trips too. Once coming home from the front, I loaded a platoon of the most ragged, worn out and wasted soldiers you've ever seen. They were gone, unshaven, dirty, and dressed in torn, mismatched bits of uniform. Now, I'm going to show you a picture if I can find it. This is not actually that group. It's another group we brought home that, and uh, our, uh, one of our members sketched it. But that's something what, what they, these guys looked like. But the funny thing was, I had to sign for them. So I said, what's this all about? It was explained they were GIFs, Japanese Indian forces, that is, soldiers of the Indian National Army that was fighting us because they were fighting for the freedom of India, freedom from British rule. Traitors, I thought, they're for it when they get home. Actually, they were arrested when they got home and they went to trial after the war. Nehru defended them and they were greeted as heroes, which of course, in the eyes of India, they were. On another occasion, my load consisted of an army paymaster and 50,000 silver rupees. This time, my destination was not the front. 
but the area that had recently been liberated, liberated. The civil administration was reestablishing control and the police and civil servants, having had experience with worthless Japanese paper money, wanted hard cash now. We found the small strip with a small wooden hut beside it. One official was there to greet us, a young Burmese man in a smart sort of um, uh, civil uniform <clears throat> who kept repeating DSP, DSP. I took it from that that we should wait. And shortly, a very young Englishman, he looked about 20, with a pink-white complexion, arrived and introduced himself as the DSP, the District Superintendent of Police. He signed for our load and then asked if we would like to visit his headquarters, an invitation we readily accepted. After a short Jeep ride through the jungle, we stopped before a large weathered wooden structure. It looked very like an old Ontario barn, but with a flat roof. Inside there was one huge room, gloomy because the only light was what came through the cracks between the boards. No floor, just bare ground. Small fires burned here and there, and about each squatted a few natives, hunched and dispirited. My prisoners, the DSP explained, they're dacoits who picked up arms left after the battle and then been terrorizing the neighborhood. They look pretty harmless, I said. Any one of them, he replied, would as soon cut your throat as shake your hand. Come upstairs. We did, and came into one large room, as big as the downstairs room, and covered with piles of armaments, absolutely every sort of gun and weapon an infantry man could use, things that the dacoits these brigands, outlaws, had picked up on the battlefield after the war, the battle was over. But there was everything there, rifles, pistols and revolvers, tommy guns, bayonets, machetes, anti-tank guns, mortars and mortar large launchers and, and swords, a huge pile of swords taken from Japanese officers. If you want a souvenir, take your pick, said the DSP. I was tempted by the swords, but deterred by the thought of getting at home, I chose instead a Mauser pistol. The last three inches had been roughly sawn off. A Mauser is actually about 18 inches long. It's half a rifle rather than a, a pistol. Anyway, the last three inches had been so raw, sawn off very roughly. But I was intrigued because the writing on one side, the stamping of, on, in the metal on the one side was Japanese and the other side was German. An indication that the axis was perhaps morally closely connected than we knew. Well, when the when we began operating, the tour was 300 hours. Then it was increased to 500 hours. And shortly after that, to 700 hours. My logbook showed that as of August the 10th, 1945, I had flown 704 hours and 45 minutes. Operational time, that is. I was tour expired. In the following weeks, I did flying jobs, mainly flying tests. 
I did nine of those in a row. The last two on KN, aircraft KN-258. I wanted to be sure about that aircraft because on September the 2nd, 1945, my crew and I crawled into KN-258 and took off for the last leg, first leg of our flight back to Britain. Farewell, Burma. The squadron ever, however, had one more assignment. Throughout the campaign, a small guerrilla outfit, Force 136, had been active behind the lines in the deep southeast corner of Burma. Now, the Japanese army, thoroughly vanquished, destroyed and disorganized and dispirited, was desperately trying to reorganize in that same region. And Force 136 found itself in need of extra supply attention. A detachment from 435 Squadron was sent down to meet this need. It was a mountainous area and the monsoon was at its height. Aware of the extreme need, our pilots made every attempt to make their deliveries, flying up narrow valleys into a heavy dead end of cloud, practically dive bombing to get their dog and then squirming and crawling to find a way out. The pilots all agreed it was the worst flying they'd seen in Burma. But their effort, efforts were recognized when the senior army liaison officer sent his thanks. I'm quoting, to all members of 435 detachment, you have in four days broken all previous records. Headquarters are extremely grateful beyond words for your efforts. Field reports are slow to arrive, but those received so far report excellent drops. Canucks, we wish you a good trip home and happy landings. And I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you for listening to my story. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. <laughs> Pat, it's up to you. Bob? Bob, can you hear me? Yes. Bob, in one of your slides, it's Tony Partington here, in one of your slides of the uh, kickers pushing out a load out the door, yeah. you had four men there, and I didn't see one of them with a safety belt or strapped into the airplane. Did you lose anyone over the side in one of those drops with all the... Doing one man, one man once... Oh, you've hit a you've hit a soft spot here, a bad spot. One man once did drop out. Uh, uh, actually, he caught himself on the on the uh, static line retaining cord, and and he was pulled back in. Just that happened once. It should never have happened. Not only did they not have any sort of uh, retaining strap on. They didn't have parachutes. We, the crew, had parachutes. But it never occurred to anyone that the kickers ought to have parachutes. Ask me about the kickers. That's another story. <laughs> is, I, is there another question? I'll ask you about the kicker then. What about them? Well, the, kicker, uh, we, the kickers were a ground crew, and the ground crew members of the, the squadron could volunteer, and they got 50 cents a day for flying with us. Uh, and one man on 435 Squadron 
flew his 700 hours, operational hours with us and kept up his work as an airframe mechanic. And he actually got a, a certificate of having completed a tour of operations. I don't know if any other uh, ground crew man ever got a, a tour for doing an, a, for a certificate for doing a tour of operations. But our other kickers came from various places. One time we had uh, got them from a West African detention center. These were men who were in detention that happened what you could what you would in normal life, civil life, call a prison for various offenses. And they also could volunteer to fly with us. And they never, well, never got parachutes either. Uh, but they were good men. They were great, brawny, good-looking fellows, very dark. And uh, when they were loading the aircraft, one man would just sit and sing and uh, keep time. And they could load the, the aircraft in double time as long as he speeded up the song. But then the, I watched once when we were flying out there, I went back to, to, to the back of the aircraft to see how things were. And there was one of these great big hulking men sitting on the bags and rice back there, knitting a sock. And I thought, good for you, I can't knit a sock. I wonder if you can turn the heel. Well, on the way after the drop, I went back again and he'd taken his shoe off to get the rice out of it. His sock ended at his ankle. He didn't have a foot in it. So the, that's the answer to that. On the other hand, one of his chums came up and the uh, wireless operator gave him a pair of headsets and let him listen to Tokyo Rose, the white man's magic listen to a singer from Japan in the middle of Burma and 30, and a thousand feet up in the air. So he listened happily to the music and then it was time for the wireless operator to make a report home and he switched over to his service channel and uh, got his, his message in Morse code. The Askari, the West African, picked up a pencil and started transcribing the, the Morris code. He was a trained operator. So you never know what you got. Uh, I think that there were other, other uh, picker, uh, people that we got, we got as kickers. It, it, that ended when we got a, a couple of, of uh, men, half dozen men from the uh, British Navy in their spare time. They could get a little bit of extra money that way. They were the ones that said, we don't have parachutes, we're not going. Uh, and they were right in saying that, but we didn't have parachute for them. So that didn't change anything. Yeah, Is there, are there any other questions? Um, well, not a question, but um, didn't you say that when you were flying through that monsoon crowd, uh, cloud that you had to put your feet on the on the dash to, you know. To we did that, that was in, the, in that, when we got caught with that, uh, uh, that cumulonimbus cloud, that's what Chas and I, both of us trying to move the thing, we got, did get our feet up on the dash to try and brace ourselves to pull the thing back, but we couldn't do it. No. We couldn't move the controls at all. We weren't in charge of that aircraft. Somebody else was. Oh, well, it wasn't your time. No. <laughs> so, any more questions? John Spears, no. No more questions? Well, in that case, I want to thank you, Bob, for a spellbinding presentation. Somebody that? Yes, we do. Somebody want to say something? In the chat, um, there's a question from Gino Falcone. There was a photo next to a downed zero. Is there a story regarding that photo? Bob, John Spears. Yeah, 
Bob oh. John Spears here. Where did the mules come from that you were having put on your plane? <laughs> and where did the veterinarian come? I wouldn't expect a veterinarian to be uh, oh, uh, the, common. The army, had, the army had a veterinarian corps. Okay. Yeah, because there were, well, I guess that was what a, lef a, a leftover from the days when there were a lot of uh, air, uh, horses in the army. But uh, the mules needed a veterinarian. But this, uh, um, what was your first one, John? Yeah, where did the um, mules come from? I just oh, trying to. The, they came, they came from uh, the United States. I've forgotten which, what uh, state it is. I can remember the moment. And they came by train, by boat. And one of the duties of the Canadian Home Guard, the uh, elderly men, veterans of the First World War who joined up in the Second World War and then were weeded out and not sent for, for, for uh, frontline service, one of their duties was to be a conductor for the mules that were sent across to India from the United States. Mm -hmm. This aircraft, by the way, I, I never saw a uh, Japanese aircraft on the, in the air. I saw this one on the ground down in Tonggu. That's me on the left. It was uh, actually bur burned out and uh, shot down and burned out uh, nearby where we were. That was the only time I saw a Japanese aircraft. This is not on. This is not on. This. No arms. Hmm? The next question is from Eric Morris. Eric, go ahead. Morris. I'm now unmuted, I think. Um, Bob, that was an absolutely stunning presentation. Uh, you're going to get a write-up in members' news that will embarrass you. Uh, but uh, I don't have a question. But looking at this picture you've got up, uh, that's you on the left looking stunningly handsome. I am completely <laughs> flabbergasted at how small those zeros were. Oh, yeah. And they were light. They were very small. They were very, very light. They could turn turn inside a Spitfire, no problem whatsoever. And, and they had no. Wait a minute. Yes, they had great range too, but they had absolutely no armor plating. Our our fighters always had a, an armor plate at the back of behind the pilot. These had no armor plating, and that's why they, why they were so. Uh, fast and so nimble, uh, and they were shot down very often too. But it is a small plane, isn't it? We had absolutely no armor and no armament on our planes. We were unarmed. And after that, uh, Herb Coons was shot down, uh, at least uh, damaged, he was not shot down, but the others were at Schwebo. Uh, we were told we would have a fighter escort. Well, the uh, fighter escort was no good to us. They wouldn't fly because we, they were so much faster than us, they couldn't keep that back with us. So they said, oh, we're giving you umbrella coverage. I never saw it. I don't know that we ever had any uh, fighter cover umbrella while we were flying. I think, Mort, you got a question, have you? Mort Lightstone? Maybe not. I'm Mike. Oh, no. <clears throat> Hello, Bob. My name is Mort Lightstone. Can you hear me okay? I can. Good. I'm a navigator. And my question, did, of course, deals with navigation. <laughs> you're, you're flying in the Far East with under those conditions. Uh, the wartime conditions, what was the most useful navigation aid that you used? In Burma, it was a map. 
you know, you can imagine there were no uh, now there was a homing device to come home on. Uh, it was pretty rudimentary, but we could find a, a radio radio direction to bring us home, RDF to come home on. And, uh, uh, going out, there was no 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 navigational aids, and uh, Rip kept a map uh, on a, 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 a on his map. He kept uh, his track course and track, but it, there was we never measured a wind, and uh, there was. No, very few landmarks, especially in northern Burma, it was just jungle and mountains. Uh, so I don't know really how Rip found the, the dropping zone sometimes. There's not much help as, uh, to, to you as a navigator, is it? <laughs> but I trusted Rip. He, he did it every time. You always managed to get to the target and back home. Well, he, he did, yeah. Uh, and the targets, were, I guess when we got near to the target, he could map read, but he was very good at map reading. I mean, there was one, we had one chance for a, a, a pinpoint, and that was when we crossed the chin wind. Then he would know where we crossed the chin wind. That he could identify. After that, landmarks were scarce. Although that doesn't hold, by the way, after we got out of northern Burma. Southern Burma is flat and nothing but paddy fields, but there are roads and villages and uh, Mandalay and other small towns. So that was easier. But in the north, I don't know how a navigator found his way around. There's no more, que any more questions, last chance. There's a question in the chat from a Diane Maddox. Uh, she says, thank you so much for a very informative and interesting presentation. What is the name of your book? And do you also do presentations for the high school? I love, <laughs> I love giving presentations to the high school. Just get in touch with the memory project or uh, Historica Canada, they're the ones that uh, make arrangements for that. Do you know about the history, the memory project? If you don't, just look up either the memory project or Historica Canada. But yes, I do give uh, high school presentations. Now, I've for already forgotten the first part of your comment, though. The name of the book. Oh, that's important, isn't it? Here's my book. For Your Tomorrow. When the Japanese were chased out of Burma, or out of India, actually, it was at a place called Kohima, a little wee place on the very middle of the supply line. And it was besieged for 16 days, mercilessly besieged, night and day for 16 days. And when the siege was lifted, the second British division put on a piece of native rock what must be the most poignant epitaph of the first, Second World War. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. And that's where the name comes from for my book. You can get it. I have copies of it, 20 bucks a piece, or you can get it from pretty well any library. Including us, you might. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bob. I've only got two words, outstanding and absolutely spellbounding. Thank you so, so much. And um, 
as I have repeatedly said, now I do so again and again and again, there is no comparison or equal to first-hand account. And tonight we have a first-hand account that demonstrated it. Um, Bob, I felt I was right there with you, flying in that cockpit. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. It's just, you pay, you, you, um, it was a marvelous presentation. Now at this time, I usually present you with a thank you gift from our CMI. That being virtually impossible, keep a sharp eye for Canada Post and they're gonna do it for me. Oh, thank you, Pat. You're and welcome. thank you for this opportunity. Oh my God, thank you for doing it. It's um, a revelation. Um, my next military history night is scheduled for January the 13th, 2021. So save that date. Topic, embedded, two Canadian journalists a burlesque queen, I did say a burlesque queen, and the expedition to oust Louis Riel. Uh, speaker Ted Glenn, save that date, January the 13th, 2021. And um, as I say, after watching your presentation, uh, Bob, all I can say is Hollywood, move over. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for your participation and look forward to seeing you all again virtually in 2021. And I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and a happy, healthy, and safe New Year. And I now declare this meeting declared ended. Thank you again. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.